We begin with a question on the rise of far-right anti-immigration movements in countries like Great Britain. Do such movements and the support that they attract drive media coverage, or is it the other way around? Do the news media, through excessive coverage, help manufacture that support? Take Tommy Robinson, who calls himself a warrior for freedom of speech on issues such as migration. When he rails against the supposedly creeping influence of political Islam in UK society, that resonates with audiences. But what came first, his newfound popularity or the coverage of him? A recent academic study suggests that right-wing anti-immigration political parties such as the UK Independence Party, UKIP, owe more of their success to the news media than they would care to admit. The news outlets do far more than just reflect current events. This is a story about British politics, but the issue at the core of it, the relationship between the far right and the news media, is a dynamic at play in many countries around the globe. Our starting point this week is London. Tommy Robinson, the leader of the... The leader of the EDL. Tommy Robinson, leader of the EDL. When it comes to figures like Tommy Robinson, the question isn't just when to cover him or how. Do you take any responsibility for that being hate speech? Do you think that's hate speech? I'm asking. No, do you think that's hate speech? I'm asking you. The larger question is why. When you scroll back to the beginning, to when Robinson had no tangible following, did the British media cover him and provide him with a platform in the first place? The intuitive idea that I think a lot of people have in their minds, many journalists included, is that if you see some sort of idea or actor that you find troubling, let's say, with respect to the public interest, you want to go and report on that. You want to say, look, this might be a problem. The counterintuitive model, which is I think the one that actually holds in reality, is that it actually ends up being a feeding frenzy. I've got a lot to say, but nothing to you. That boosts these figures further and further into public support. This is what right-wing extremism in the UK looks like. 14 months ago, a man plowed his van into a crowd near a mosque in London. There were nine casualties and one fatality. At the trial, the court was told that the driver, Darren Osborne, wanted to kill Muslims, was a follower of Tommy Robinson, and had been in email contact with him just days before the attack. British broadcasters saw nothing wrong with interviewing Robinson, giving him airtime the day after the attack, and again once the trial concluded. Tommy Robinson has repeatedly been bailed out by the media. Darren Osborne mowed uh, a bunch of uh, pedestrians down for no other reason than that uh, he assumed they were Muslims. Uh, he did so inspired by Tommy Robinson's ideology. I would stop. You would ban all Muslims? I would temporarily halt Muslim immigration to this country. The very day after the murder, uh, they put him on Good Morning Britain. The day after Darren Osborne goes to jail, they bring Tommy Robinson on to BBC Newsnight and give him a chance to represent himself as a martyr. We had three terrorist attacks in, in, in quick succession, and rather than talk about them as a radicalising factor for why this man, re this why this man reacted, you want to put it on the fact that I report the truth. Me, Every single time the media has given him a platform and made a, a politician out of somebody who was essentially a far-right football hooligan. One of the most dangerous games that the that the political um, political liberals and the left have played over recent years has been to call for the banning of views they don't like. Because underlying all of this is a contemptuous underestimation of our fellow citizens who we assume are going to be easily duped, easily turned into racists, easily influenced. I think that's a very uh, dangerous, contemptuous, a way of treating our fellow citizens. Lots of people talk about media coverage anecdotally, impressionistically, but relatively few quantify it and analyze it. An academic study published last week in the British Journal of Political Science examined more than a decade's worth of coverage by British newspapers of UKIP, the UK Independence Party, an anti-immigration party which fought for Britain's departure from the European Union. The authors looked at the chicken and egg question of what came first. Was it UKIP's rise in popularity, followed by increased coverage? Or did the press coverage of the party precede its surge in support and have a causal effect? We found that media coverage is a predictor of public support in future periods. But we did not find any evidence that public support 
is a predictor of media coverage. So there appears to be a unique causal effect between media coverage of these far right wing populist parties and their rise in electoral significance. I don't think that the media should be in the business of making moral decisions about what kind of voices are heard on the media. I don't think the media is to blame for the rise of Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson has opinions which should be heard, argued over, discussed. And that's not the same as saying that you endorse those opinions. Depriving him of mainstream media coverage just means that he gains a certain uh, mystique as though his ideas are so frightening that you have to keep them out of the mainstream. The British media have been creating a space for whatever reason uh, for the far right well in advance of any ostensible support for them and uh, to justify it by saying ah but if we put them on television we'll expose them and what turns out to be the case is that journalists know very little about the history of the far right about the history of the individuals they are arguing with um, about their politics or even about how to uh, engage with or challenge their most offensive claims. In the end, they end up being played by the far right. One of the broadcasters that interviewed Tommy Robinson over the Darren Osborne case last year and has since given airtime to his supporters is the BBC. This is how it explained its decision to provide them with a platform. There will be some politicians, public figures or views featured in our news coverage that some of our audience will find unpalatable. We wouldn't, however, censor a political viewpoint, as we have a duty to create a platform where as wide a range of voices as possible can be heard. We aim to analyze and scrutinize the facts so our audience can make up their own minds. BBC wasn't the only British media outlet we approached with questions. We also wrote to ITV and a radio station, LBC. Neither chose to comment. They've let their work speak for itself. Generally, journalists are relatively inhospitable to extreme fringe far right wing populist viewpoints. But once those actors do force themselves onto the agenda, then there's a feeding frenzy that occurs. So that's how I think media and journalists specifically can produce a reality that they actually don't really want to see. With the governing conservatives divided over Brexit, the opposition Labour Party split over the same issue, and the mostly pro-Brexit tabloid press still pushing its agenda, British politics is already in a messy state. And when the broadcast media, even with the best of journalistic intentions, put the likes of Tommy Robinson on their air so that they can grill him, they find they cannot do so without giving him the exposure he craves. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That is where Britain seems to find itself today. And the news media aren't just reporting the story. Many times, they have a hand in driving it. <laughs>